Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's drink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 204, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net, or call the voicemail hotline at 202-930-1109, and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 204th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name is Tim Mooney, and I'm super excited to have you here for another edition about all the bike touring goodness that is available to us, uh, to the extent that it's available to us at this point. But uh, maybe you're listening to this in the future when there's much more available, which we know is going to be coming sooner rather than later. So I'm just trying to remain on the positive tip for all of this. And, you know, that's uh, that's what I'm seeing a little bit more of lately these days. And I thought I would share some of that in the news and housekeeping section before we jump into the next project for the next several weeks, which is revisiting a former bike tour that I haven't thought so much about in the last or I don't know, several years. And basically all of us kind of reliving that ride through a never before released tour journal. So let's get cracking. First up on the show is some news and housekeeping, some really exciting news out of the CNO. Now, the campsites are still closed, so that's kind of the bummer. I, I, I'm really looking forward to a point sometime in the next few weeks, few months, whatever, when those campsites do reopen so I can get out and do a tour and share that with you, of course, uh, here on the pod. But as I sit here right now, they're still closed. But there is actually some good news. Uh, first, the trail's in great shape. I went out on a little mini Mother's Day hike with Kimberly and the pups, and everything looks to be in great shape, and it's just going to be there for us. But I think there's another piece of really great news for those of us especially who live or operate or intend to tour more on the D.C. side of things. That new surfacing project that I've been talking about over the course of oh, various podcasts and uh, the most recent tour, of course, that's been expanding. And the news out of the c and uh, headquarters, basically, is that they're going to be connecting up Swain's Lock with White's Ferry, which means that, A, the credit stretch of that entire trail, as far as I'm concerned, and the mile marker 25-ish area or so, 25 to 30, that's going to get fixed. And B, that means that when this is all paired together uh, sometime later this year, about mile marker 17 to 72 will be really, really fantastic smooth riding, representing roughly about one-third of the total trail. I think that's great stuff, and it's yet another reason to ride the trail when we can. So thought I'd share that bit of good news. Also, file under good news. The Sprocket Shift Happy Hours continue. We've done a few live shows, and the date of the next one is going to be posted at pedalshift.net slash happy hour. Check that all out. It's a tight 40 minutes on a topic, and we always get kicked off of Zoom in a super comical way. That is good enough reason to join, you know, at least at the end, I suppose. All right, next up on the show, and for the next several episodes, it's going to be revisiting a ride on the Erie Canal Trail in New York State. Since bike touring adventures are, well, on pause for the time being, but the desire to be on them really isn't, I'm speaking for myself and hopefully all of you as well. The Pedal Shift Project is proud to dust off um, some never-released tour journals of past rides. For the next several weeks, we're going to be revisiting my 2015 tour of the trail that started it all for me, literally, the Erie Canal Bike Trail. I am going to be replaying this tour journal, which was released only to folks who signed up for the newsletter. So I would say 99% of you probably have never heard this tour journal before. Even though I spoke about this uh, around episodes number 24 and 25 of the pod, the tour journals themselves have never been released. So I thought it would be it's high time to basically dust them off and share them with you. So, but I'm going to do it a little bit differently. Rather than just make this weeks of essentially a best of, I'm going to pop in from time to time with a little 2020 perspective on the ride. Um, I'm going to be listening to this for the first time as I produce these shows, as you are for the first time in years, really, for me. So in a lot of ways, it's sort of like doing it all over again. So far, what I've done uh, to this point, I've been completely reminded of things that were big ticket deals as a part of this ride that I had completely forgotten. So this is Frankly, this is as therapeutic for me as maybe it will be for you. So let's get going. All right, a little background on the Erie Canal ride. 
This is a very special region to me. If you've been listening to earlier shows, you know that I'm a Western New York native. I grew up in a town called Fairport, New York, which is outside of Rochester, New York. It's a, one of the uh, third or fourth largest cities in the state, probably best known for the Erie Canal in the early days and then Eastman Kodak, uh, the company, because George Eastman was from the Rochester area and really built up Kodak as a major company there. The Erie Canal has always been very special to me because having grown up in Fairport, that's one of the Erie Canal port towns. And for most of us, we who grew up in the area, the canal was sort of this mystical thing. Um, there was a ton of history to it. We learned all of the songs of that were sung uh, by the, the boatmen and women of the day. It was our swimming hole. Not a very nice one. Kind of a gross one, actually. Uh, we'd jump off bridges when we weren't supposed to and just used that whole area as a giant playground. And the thing that was really cool about it growing up was we knew that this iconic piece of history stretched for miles in either direction, from Albany to Buffalo, as the song goes. All right, back to 2020 me for a second here. Um, At this point, I thought I would play a little bit of that song that I referenced. I realized when I first did the show, I made this reference to a song that I figured everybody knew, but of course, probably almost none of you actually knew. This is called uh, 15 Years on the Erie Canal, and it's a song that they literally taught us in school. We went on field trips, and it's just this cool old-timey song, so I thought I'd play a little snippet of it for you here. It's going to show up again later in the episode as the backdrop to uh, a story that you're going to be hearing from a friend of the show, Ethan Georgie. But until then, let's listen to the song a bit. I've got an old mule, and her name is Sal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. She's a good old worker and a good old pal. Fifteen years on the Erie Canal. We've hauled some barges in our day. Filled with lumber, coal and hay. And every inch of the way I know. From Albany to Buffalo. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, we must be getting near a town. You can always tell your neighbor, you can always tell your pal, if he's ever navigated on the Erie Canal. The towpath just stretched beyond as far as the eye could see. And although a lot of us were riding our bikes along this towpath, we knew that if we kept going, In one direction, we'd end up in Buffalo. If we went the other direction, we'd go all the way to Albany. And that was something that I have to say, maybe in the back of my mind, became the genesis of my excitement for bike touring. Because the concept that I could hop on my bike and just keep going and get to these towns that were so much further away, that were pointable on a map. I've talked about, you know, my fascination with, you know, being able to sort of point on a map and say, oh, I've gone this far and it's really far. That might be where it all came from. And that's why this is sort of a back-to-basics tour for me. I've never done a bike tour on the Erie Canal. In fact, the longest I've done is actually a couple of towns on it. Um, I wasn't into bike touring when I was a kid or as a young adult. So this is uh, kind of merging a lot of things for me. I'm very excited about that. I want to talk a little bit more about the region, the uh, canal towns that I referred to earlier. Fairport's just one of them. There are quite a few that are there. They're small, generally. There's often really funky bridges that cross the Erie Canal, and uh, some of them are unique in how they're designed. They do have to lift in some way to let larger boats through. The one in Fairport's very famous. It's called the Lift Bridge. Other bridges, of course, are normal style hinge bridges. The lift bridge in Fairport is very famous and that's actually where I'm going to be doing a bit of a starting point. I will be starting in another part of the state a little bit further west and I'll be coming back to Rochester going down to Fairport and that's going to be sort of the spiritual beginning of it even though there's going to be quite a few miles before then and uh, then I'll be working my way through all of these different trail towns or these these canal side towns and they're really iconic they're really picturesque and I'm really excited to share them for, uh, with you for those of you who when you think of New York State you think mostly of New York City this is going to be a real change because western New York is very much unlike New York City it's much more spread out there it's much more rural in a lot of parts and the towns are really nothing like Manhattan and Brooklyn and all those other places. So if you're 
and not initiated in the ways of the rest of New York State, this will be an interesting time for you as well. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the Erie Canal. It was, um, well, first of all, physically, it's an impressive kind of thing. It was a really major, major undertaking. The idea of it was to allow goods to travel back and forth, get raw materials from the West. And of course, back then, the West was all the way in Ohio. That was the West back then. Um, and to try to get that back to ports in New York City. And the easiest way to do that was through waterways. So you had the major waterways of the Great Lakes, and those just weren't very good for moving goods very well. Um, it, it, it didn't hook into the most famous of the north-south waterways, the Hudson River, very easily. It would have to, you'd have to go all the way up, and it just wasn't really... Uh, a good way to do it. So the idea was to construct this oh, roughly 350, 360 mile uh, river, a canal, so that it would connect the Hudson River with Lake Erie in Buffalo. So Albany to Buffalo. And this really made a big difference. This made New York City into the New York City that we know today. Back, at, back in the early 1800s, Philadelphia was a much more major seaport when the Erie Canal was created and then goods and goods were able to move from Ohio much easier to New York, I'm sorry, raw materials and then goods back and forth, it allowed for the growth of the West, it allowed for New York to grow in a much bigger way. So it was proposed first in 1807, construction began about 10 years later in 1817, and there is a big difference in elevation from beginning to end. This was a really major engineering feat for the day. It seems kind of simplistic now, locks and things like that. This was sort of high technology of the day. This was sort of like, you know, crazy iPhone of the day, and it really blew a lot of people away. What was kind of cool about it was um, not unlike the CNO, which, you know, if you've been listening to the podcast, you are familiar with it. There are boats, and those boats were propelled by animals, usually mules or some kind of pack animals, and it was really efficient. If you believe Wikipedia, which I'm kind of glancing at right now, it cut transportation costs by about 95% uh, citation needed, so believe that, grain of salt with that. Whatever, it made a huge difference. It was way quicker, way cheaper, way easier to move all of these goods back and forth. In um, the later part of the 1800s, it got enlarged. In the 1900s, it got lar enlarged again. As you started to get further and further into the 20th century, we had different types of transportation systems, and the efficiencies of those sort of made the Erie Canal sort of go away. And by the time I was a kid, it was very rarely being used for actual barge traffic. And, you know, later on in the kind of late, late 20th century, it was basically turned into more of a recreational type of a thing. And that's really what it is right now. So not unlike the CNO, it was retired because the technology out eclipsed it all. And it still remains as a bit of a history lesson. It still remains as something that links a lot of communities together. And it's a really kind of cool, I don't know, iconic thing. Um, again, I grew up with it. So this is something that's really interesting and important to me. And I'm really glad... Uh, that I'm going to be able to share this with all of you as part of the tour. When it comes to the riding conditions for this trail, it's very similar to probably the Gap, the Great Allegheny Passage that we talked about in Volume 2 of the tour journals, the DC to Pittsburgh ride. It's um, a compact, kind of a limestone type of a surface. It resists rain pretty well. It rides very nicely. It's obviously not as uh, quick or as satisfying as a nice smooth asphalt or concrete, but uh, on the type of bike that I ride, I've got the nice wide tires. It will handle it really, really well. It's very flat riding, very open in a lot of places. There's not a ton of shade. You know, I've talked about the green tunnels of, of the CNO and the Gap. Because the canal is obviously open water, there's going to be a little bit more sun. It's going to be interesting because um, I'm very familiar, of course, with the areas where I grew up. My supposition is that there's going to be a lot more openness uh, as as I go further on. I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the route I'm going to take as well. I said before that I'm going to be starting in a different section of the state, moving my way east and then working my way west. I'm going to be starting in a town called Batavia, New York. And Batavia, for those of you who are familiar with Western New York, you know that's sort of famously right between Rochester and Buffalo. And uh, it's most famous when you go uh, by motorized vehicle on the uh, New York State Thruway. You see this big turf farm. So you see this enormous large lawn is where they grow grass to bring to 
other people's lawns, basically. That's Batavia. That's what most people know Batavia for anyways. I'm going there because my girlfriend's going to be doing a week-long retreat there. Batavia seems like a strange place for that, but that is what it is. So she's going to be staying there. I'm going to be getting in on my bike, and then I'm going to be going east to Rochester, spend some time with family overnight, and then I'm going to work my way down to Fairport, and then I'm going to start to work my way west. Hey there, me again, uh, just interrupting for a moment. You'll notice that I said that I was going to go west? Eh, well, turns out I didn't. You're going to hear more why in a little bit. So the temperature conditions, I would say, largely going to be pretty warm. Western New York is rather temperate. Um, it'll probably be some cool nights. Uh, always a possibility of some thunderstorms, so I'm going to be ready for getting mm, some rain, maybe some adverse conditions. The nice thing is that there's a ton of towns along the way, so it'll be real easy to duck into places. If the weather gets really terrible, then obviously there's opportunities that I can go, you know, get an Airbnb or a hotel as necessary, but I am intending to camp um, the entire time, if I can, with the exception of the night that I'll be staying with family um, on the first night. The uh, one thing that is really interesting about the Canal Way is it does not have a ton of camping opportunities that are traditional campsites. However, there are opportunities to stay at any of the locks, and the, the bridges in some towns are allowed as well. If there are operators, there are small parts of land that you're allowed to camp on, according to the uh, Canal's main website. One other thing that I've learned is that the Canal Way property and I want to say this properly, it sounds like that it's not illegal to camp on it. So there's going to be some opportunities for some wild camping that I'm really looking forward to. And the nice thing is, is that because there's going to be so many towns, I think what I'm going to probably do is not plan on doing any kind of uh, eating in camp. I'll probably be eating in the towns and I'll probably just be using the camps for sleep especially when I do some of the wild camping. So that's going to be kind of some fun opportunity to uh, kind of hone my skills a little bit in that area. And I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, it should be kind of interesting because it's kind of flat terrain, um, not really good classic wild camping scenarios. But uh, of course, I'll be taking pictures and sharing that along with everybody. <laughs> It's really interesting hearing how I was kind of hot to trot to do wild camping for this particular trip. As it turned out, I didn't really do it. In fact, I, well, I shouldn't say didn't really. I didn't. I was always in legal campsites and never did any wild camping, which is an interesting juxtaposition because I thought there was going to be plenty of availability. But at the time, and as you'll hear as I go along in these tour journals, there wasn't quite um, the type of wild camping that I was looking for at the time. I think now I've learned a little bit more in the last five or so years, and I think that there are probably good wild camping opportunities there. The only question is, is whether you need them or not. I mean, if you can camp at any of the locks... And there are they are plentiful. Um, you know, things are spaced out pretty well for all of that. Uh, I do think that it would be difficult in a lot of areas. So, for instance, where I grew up in Fairport, I mean, the trail's going through literally a town. You'd be you'd be wild camping in somebody's backyard, which is not recommended at all. So, um, but I do think that down the road uh, that I would potentially do some wild camping because there are opportunities in western and central New York to do that. You know, when I was doing the show back in 2015, I was doing some more storytelling in more produced segments, and I really love this piece that I'm about to share with you. A, it really is a nice kickoff to this tour, and the story that Ethan Georgie shares is kind of fun and interesting and cool, but there's a callback to this story later on down the road in the tour journals when I go through the area that Ethan's talking about. I think you're going to enjoy this. I really enjoyed listening to it again because I haven't heard it in years. Check it out. Type 2 fun. This is a bicycle touring story courtesy of... Friend of the show, Ethan Georgie. You know, sometimes on a bike tour, the answer is often right in front of you and you don't even know it. Here's Ethan. In early October of last year, I rode from Buffalo to Albany, New York, along the Erie Canal Way Trail. 15 years on the Erie Canal. The Erie Trail is... A towpath that runs alongside the Erie Canal. This was built back in the 1800s, and it was a major, major economic engine for a very young United States of America. I mean, now it's used for basically recreation. Boaters are on the canal, and bikers and hikers will often be on the Canalway Trail. It's really well marked, but it breaks off in some small towns, and some enterprising types have helped out with the markers where the trail breaks off by painting in some pink arrows on the concrete to make sure that people know where they're going. I'd 
been following pink arrows since Buffalo. I had learned to trust the pink arrows in Syracuse. They often had encouraging phrases, which I found humorous since I was doing this alone. Low bridge, everybody down. Low bridge, we must be getting near a town. You can only tell your neighbor, you can only tell your pal, if he's ever navigated on the Erie Canal. The trip was supposed to take me seven days. On day six, after riding 50 miles, I got to Chanja Harry. Yep, for those of you who are going, Chanja what? This part of New York State appropriates a lot of the Iroquois names, the local Native American tribe. So there's towns called Arondequoit, Canandaigua, and, of course, Chanja Harry. Anyways. There's a little black metal bridge, and the pink arrows told me to take a right, so I did. Put your faith in the pink arrows. You've got to believe in the pink arrows. And when they said to go up this hill, and the next, and the next, I did. Much love to the pink arrows. At which point... I realized I was nowhere near the Erie Canalway Trail. I was, in fact, in the middle of farm country. Little upstate New York geography lesson here. Ethan was about halfway to Pennsylvania and very much off route. I was going to have to skip my planned route and ride another 50 miles back to Albany, running out of water and daylight with temperatures falling. Spoiler alert, Ethan made it back. That day was what they call type two fun. I can laugh about it now. When spring came around, I wanted to get back out to Canada Harry to finish the rest of the Erie Canalway Trail. A friendly coworker gave me a lift, and I set about trying to find a trail when I got there. Directly across the street was the Black Metal Bridge, with a pink arrow pointing to the right. I stood on the pink arrow, where months ago I had turned right, and I looked straight ahead. I think it was Einstein who said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Follow the pink arrow, or... Wait, what's that over there? The big trail marker was just across the street. So the pink arrow? It was less, go this way 50 miles and more, hey, look across the intersection. There's a trail and you're welcome. I have no idea how I missed it. Sometimes directions are in the eye of the beholder, and sometimes they lead you to type 2 fun. So the beginning of this trip, as I mentioned, was in a town called Batavia, New York. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kimberly was having a retreat or was attending a retreat at kind of like a Buddhist Zen center, which as somebody who grew up not terribly far from Batavia and had uh, a lot of things in my head about what Batavia really is, you know, it was essentially kind of a drive-by thing whenever I was going to Buffalo for whatever reason I would be going to Buffalo for. Um, But to find this really peculiar but very cool Zen center in a place I didn't expect, that was kind of a fun way to kick off this tour. When you find out something that completely goes counter to your expectations, it's kind of a fun discovery. And that was something that I thought was a great way to kick off the tour. So as I was leaving Batavia, um, this was the one section that I was, I guess, the most nervous about because I literally had never ridden in this part of the state before. And I certainly hadn't ridden on any of the roads. So Google Maps was my friend and it created a nice little route. But as we'll discover, as we'll hear in this very, very early kind of, I call it day one, but in a sense, it was day zero because I wasn't really on the trail. I was working my way back from where I had dropped Kimberly off and the car. I was just basically, we had brought the bike and all the gear, and I was trying to basically ride home. And this was the beginning of that adventure. Just a couple of entries uh, that we're going to close out the show with, but this was one of my more fond memories of this entire trip because I ended up going from Batavia all the way through the city of Rochester, and basically uh, that's effectively a homecoming for me. So glad to share this again. I am rolling, finally. Uh, it's a little late in the day for me to be starting a tour. I was just talking about this with my girlfriend as I was dropping her off. I'm used to finishing at about 4 or 5 o'clock on most days, if not earlier sometimes. But here I am starting at uh, 5 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, pardon the wind because this road is fast and it is nice. And I've got a bit of a race till sundown. 8.56 p.m. in Webster, New York, which is my destination for the night. That's uh, where my mother and father live still, and uh, no tent for me. I get a house. I get pizza and wings and beer for dinner, so that's where I'm rushing to. Uh, I'll have more tomorrow, I think. This will be a 
uh, kind of a limited day. It's going to be about 40 miles, give or take, from uh, the Batavia area. Really beautiful roads here. Um, it's uh, nice and wide shouldered. I'm on Byron Batavia Road for the fans. And uh, it's a uh, you know, big farming area and really, really quite gorgeous. It's uh, in the low 80s, and uh, although it's a bit sunny, it, it's not not too bad. And uh, as I said, the uh, roads are riding really fast. I'm used to a lot hillier terrain when I'm on asphalt, so this is kind of nice. So that's it for uh, the uh, first part of today. Hopefully I'll, I'll check in on the other side uh, later on today, but we'll have much, much more tomorrow as we uh, really kick it off in earnest. One very quick note, I am going to be changing the route. I am instead of going west to Buffalo and Niagara Falls and doing a loop, I've decided that I'm going to go east for a variety of reasons that I'll share uh, on a subsequent show here on Tour Journals. But I'm going to be going hopefully all the way to Albany. And uh, there's lots of good reasons for that, including, uh, hey, I uh, don't have to loop, but I can see all new stuff every day. So that's that. We'll talk to you on the flip side, perhaps closer to Webster or in Webster itself. Hey, it's Battleship Tour Journal, Volume 3, Erie Canal, uh, from S- Swamp Road, which, thank you, Google Maps, for finding this very interesting route. Uh, I was expecting to be on uh, rather um, traditional state highways and back country roads. Google Maps found me about maybe one quarter of my ride, maybe a touch less than that, is on a, uh, oh boy, it feels like kind of what's used for ATVs perhaps during the winter. It is not paved, very rocky, a little tricky. This would not be a skinny tire route, but uh, on my uh, two-inch tires, on the uh, steel-framed Sequoia Sempervians Novara Safari, it's chewing it up pretty well, although as you can hear, it's uh, pretty bumpy and rocky. A uh, lot slower than what it was before, but uh, I'll take it. I kind of like it. I'm still hoping to beat sunset, although I do have lights on me, so that won't be a problem. It would be just for the last few minutes, I would think. Anyway, so I uh, wanted to check in while I, since I was on a traffic-free spot and I could easily record while I was rolling, I wanted to mention why I'm changing my route. Um, had a listener uh, check in, and forgive me, I cannot remember your name, uh, but a listener who uh, uh, shot a, a tweet at me uh, saying that uh, she was surprised that I was not going to be doing the uh, entire Erie Canal, and you know, that's largely a function of time. Oh, speaking of no traffic, here comes traffic. An ATV. Hello, sir. Whew. Well, I think I'd rather take trucks. Yikes. All right. Um, well, I'm temporarily blinded by the dust. Maybe I'll slow down a little bit here. Um, anyways, the uh, 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 reason why I wasn't going to do the entire trail was I just, frankly, don't have enough days. If I had another, I think I need another full day, if not two, to be able to do Buffalo to Albany. And in addition to that, I'm starting from Batavia, which is off of the canal to begin with, so I'm sort of not even really on the trail today. So the idea was that I was going to do a loop starting and ending in Batavia, going east to Rochester, then back west to Buffalo, cross over to the falls, come back to Batavia, and that would be the tour, which would have been a perfectly fine tour. However, uh, I had seen before and was reminded by, again, forgive me, I cannot remember your name as I'm cycling here, but uh, the uh, uh, person who uh, let me know about all this reminded me again that there was a massive, massive group tour that starts in Buffalo on, on Sunday, tomorrow as I'm recording this, and heads eastward in a giant wall of bicycles. And uh, I think even having to deal with salmoning that crew for a day would have been a bit tricky and maybe a bit uh, uh, less, less than fun, suboptimal fun. So instead, rather than try to fight that, um, and rather than do a loop, um, I'll get to cover more ground if I go all the way out east towards Syracuse and then eventually Albany. And I've got some options 
to uh, transport myself and my bike on the way back, uh, perhaps as soon as Thursday night, and then spending another night in the Rochester area uh, then, uh, or maybe some other options as well. We'll, we'll have to see. I think I'm going to play that all by ear. Uh, but that's a reason. It's, it's uh, more fun, I think, of a route. I'll get to actually roll by my old college haunts. I went to Syracuse University. So uh, I'll be rolling relatively close to campus, so I might do a quick detour and swing by there, or at least roll by it, get a picture of the bike with me and my touring gear there. Um, and uh, yeah, and then eventually get to Albany. That would be quite a tour. Hi, more ATVs. Get ready for the dust. Ah, good. It's wetter around here, so it's not as dusty. Well, luckily they are avoiding me, although they're passing me at, at speed. Um, wonder how many bikes end up back here. It's kind of interesting. Anyways, a few more miles on this road, and then I'll be uh, ducking out on some well-shouldered state highways on my way through downtown Rochester, and then eventually around around Aquay Bay and up to Webster, New York. So. So Swamp Road, which was really freaking cool. I had totally forgotten about that. That led to other major highways, which got me through the outer suburbs uh, in Monroe County towards the city of Rochester. And it was really, really fun to be able to bicycle into the downtown area. Went through neighborhoods that I'd never been through before. And I will have to say there were a lot of folks who were standing on porches looking out going, I've never seen a dude <laughs> riding through his part of town with a full loaded bike and panniers. It was kind of fun and very cool uh, to, to come in through the city that way. And then I eventually ended up on a, a main thoroughfare called East Avenue. And as I was running out of light, I ended up deciding, you know what, rather than push things and rather than try to make it all the way up to Webster, eh, I put in the phone call to get a pickup. And that ended up working out really, really well. And it's also probably a good time to close out this particular chapter of the tour journal. Join us next time as we really kick off the ride in earnest, starting in my hometown, Fairport, New York. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours like the Kessel Run. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society on to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart. Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skado, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgadis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Stuart Buchan, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robert, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Henkel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Goffman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Piroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messenger, David Grotke, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Letko, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCulloch, John Hickman, Jack Smith, Carl Presso, and thanks also to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available. 